measured, and uncertainty cannot. Understanding risk means that the range of outcomes is known, and so is the likelihood for any particular outcome. But with uncertainty, you don't necessarily know what you're getting yourself into. Belize indeed does not know what it's getting itself into. The gamble of this get-rich-fast scheme at the expense of true development of a people and nation is Oceania's central concern. With the advent of BNE, Belize Natural Energy, Belize has actively joined in man's continued quest for energy. This at a time when world reserves are depleting and fuel prices have soared the highest in history. Despite this high demand, fuel prices in Belize have not decreased and production sharing agreements have not been skewed to assure Belizeans the promise of abundance of wealth. Today, the media news are fraught with the debate over a reliance on fossil fuels, the true ability to identify clean energy, and the ability of these cleaner, more sustainable sources to support our lifestyle, which is now totally dependent on energy generation. Missing from this debate is the true impact of offshore oil drilling on other productive sectors, such as tourism, fisheries, and even the local culture. For Oceana and many of its conservation partners around the world, the discussion on oil drilling has remained pivotal, as the need to inform Belizeans about an industry they know nothing about is of great urgency. There is no mass local knowledge about the oil industry, what it entails, and even much less about offshore drilling. For Belize, the greatest threat to our marine resource is now oil exploration and drilling, as it entails massive threats to our priceless barrier reef and all fish life associated with it. Natural resources scientists and conservationists point to the global statistics to justify a reason to rethink any direction to increase or continue the status quo with offshore drilling. 75% of the world's fisheries are said to be fully overfished. Or in other words, one third of the world's fisheries is said to have collapsed, and in several instances, with little hope for a bounce back. One fifth of the world's coastline protective mangrove ecosystems have been decimated. The precious coral reefs, which are only 1% of the world's marine habitat, have traditionally provided 25% of the world's fish. But that lay squarely and dangerously in peril in this modern technological world consumed with achieving the much touted economic prosperity. In Belize, we are not far from that reality. We are one of 12 countries worldwide that has earned a reputation for protecting its marine resources via marine protected areas. 10% of Belize's coastal resources lie within these managed protected zones, which have been a source of income and pride for Belize. There is great urgency in Belize to get the people informed and involved with the issue of offshore drilling, which will drastically impact their lives and future. Oceana is leading the charge to bring the information to the people. Dr. Jeffrey Short is a retired 31-year research chemist veteran who has worked with the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Much of his career has been dedicated to studying offshore drilling, its resulting impacts, and the devastating effects of those. He works with Oceana in Alaska, where he still deals with the effects of the Exxon Valdez, and recently studied the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. Over the years of its operations, offshore drilling has wreaked havoc on many pristine and not so pristine natural areas. During his visit to Belize, Dr. Short chronicled just a few of the impacts that lie at the heart of this ongoing debate. Impacts that have been owing to occurrences like the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill, which after 10 days emptied 4.2 million gallons of crude oil over an 8,000 square mile area. Sounds remotely like the size of our country? The 1979 Ishtok 1 oil spill in Campeche, Mexico, which dumped 140 million gallons of crude oil in the Bay of Campeche. The 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill, 
caused by transportation of crude in Alaska, emptying 11 million gallons of oil in a pristine, valuable marine resource. And the dumping of heavy metal with just one offshore rig being responsible for 90,000 tons of waste waters and materials into the oceans. The price we pay as a consequence of the inherent risk of offshore drilling is only worth it for those who promote it and develop it. Oil companies cannot prosper without the full political support of governments. It is no surprise then that governments everywhere buy into the schemes. Among the worldwide support from governments are the 2008 support of past U.S. President Bush to remove a federal moratorium for offshore drilling and the March 2010 tacit allowance of President Obama for some aspects of exploration offshore. As bad luck and the uncertainty of this very risky industry would have it, those approvals were blatantly shown to be ill-witted when on April 20, the Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico exploded killing 11 persons and later capsized on April 22nd, Earth Day, no less. That cruel Earth Day devastation persisted for almost three months, dumping a yet untold amount of oil into the seas as oil technocrats, oil industrialists, policymakers, resources users, and the world at large hopelessly watched the ugly black plume gushing underwater for the cameras of the worldwide news stations like CNN. And what has been the impact of this latest disaster? Even as natural resources technocrats continue to study this latest devastation, there are some critical facts that are well established with occurrences like the Exxon Valdez spill. The spill ended up killing about 250,000 seabirds, 3,000 sea otters, 300 sea lions, millions of juvenile salmon and herring. Emergency fishery closures, aimed mainly at preventing oiled gear from tainting the product, resulted in loss of market in many fisheries, and that often ended up being permanent. Prior to the Exxon Valdez, we mostly worried about physical contact. The species at greatest risk were thought to be those that live on the sea surface, where they may encounter oil directly. The other ways that oil might, may affect animals, such as the chemical effects, <clears throat> Uh, when, say, marine mammals uh, inhale hydrocarbon vapors, or fish get exposed to dissolved hydrocarbons, or when any of these animals eat oil, were thought to require unrealistically high exposures to cause harm. But studies after the Exxon Valdez found two new and much more potent toxicity mechanisms. One was embryotoxicity, illustrated here, which happens when the eggs of aquatic organisms absorb toxic components of oil, causing deformities. In the case of the Deepwater Horizon spill, an already precarious balance of natural resources, traditional livelihoods of fishing and tourism, and the oil industry were brought squarely into focus. The Gulf of Mexico is home to a coastal lifestyle that relies heavily on fisheries, its beaches for tourism, both of which succeed only because of several vital ecosystems, including marshes, which provide fish nurseries, birds and sea turtles nesting sites and serve as a buffer to protect coastlines from storm damage. The deep water spill was profoundly different from all other occurrences in recent history. The strong sunlight typical to the area increased the chances for photo-enhanced toxicity and the great depth of the discharge of oil was released at a shocking force of one ton per square centimeter at 160 degrees Celsius far more heat than is required to boil water at sea level. The spill was saturated with methane and other gases, all of which were laid to interact with the natural features of tide, currents, sunlight, and wind. The turbulence induced by contact with cold seawater produced a violent complex of interactions that favored natural dispersion of the oil into small droplets. These expanding clouds of um, uh, black clouds here are small droplets of oil being formed uh, and the white that you saw coming out right here is methane turning into methane hydrate um, and then mixing with the oil droplets to form oil droplets coated with ice crystals or ice crystals coated with oil and as it comes out you can see the effect of the pressure as this plume uh, widens uh, from the mouth of that 
the tremendous shear that was induced as this oil comes out of the pipe had profound consequences for how the oil affected the environment thereafter. And see why, uh, we need to think a little bit about what these tiny little oil droplets do to the rate at which things dissolve out of it. The single most important factor that determines how fast things dissolve out of oil is the ratio of surface area to volume. When oil's congealed in a compact mass, like this tar ball right here, there's relatively little surface area for things to dissolve out, and so the dissolution rate and consequently the weathering rate is relatively slow. When it gets broken up into tiny little micro uh, droplets on the order of 10 uh, microns or less, the surface area increases by a thousandfold, and that means that the rate of all these processes increases by a thousandfold. And that means that what takes a year to dissolve out of this one centimeter tar ball takes a few hours out of these little micro droplets or out of an oil slick that's an equivalent thickness. As the larger droplets surfaced, the smaller stayed trapped for weeks, months beneath the sea, forming the widely viewed underwater thick black oil plumes. The uncontrollable spill persisted for months and unleashed a frenzy of trials and errors all geared hopelessly to stop the devastating mess. The reason why dispersants were added at the wellhead, right down here, was to decrease the size of the oil droplets so that more of the oil would be trapped beneath the sea where it would be easier for microbes to degrade it. Unfortunately, at present, we still don't know how well this actually worked because it's so difficult to measure the oil droplet size distribution so far beneath the sea. After surfacing, the high temperatures and the strong sunlight caused the volatile components to evaporate fairly quickly, which increased the viscosity of the oil dramatically. Again, because of the high surface area of the slick, it incorporated water droplets into the oil, and that turned it into mousse, which is this If this talk all songs far removed so from the realities of life, then just the taste of Oceana Vice President's experience during her on-site visit will be sure to refocus your considerations. Just three months after the thick black slick explosion, Audrey Matura Shepard was on board Oceana's expedition vessel, The Latitude, and visited affected communities to uncover firsthand what all this meant to the real people living along the Gulf of Mexico coast. She found laborers hired just to clean up the mess coming ashore on the beach and hundreds of volunteers tediously combing miles of beach to scoop up these thick black tar balls in a desperate attempt to return beaches and coastlines to a normal state, or rather, to as normal a state as possible. As she walked the beach camera in tow, she came across Gulf Coast firemen who had given up their free days to work on beaches that they and their families once frolicked. Each volunteer clad in boots and armed with special shovels scoop seemingly endlessly. What are you looking for? Oil. How do you know it's oil? That's what it looks like. Little patties. It's kind of brown. Oh. Brown color. Glistens a little bit in the sun. Really? So you all just collect the little pieces now? Yeah, they sent us out. We'll check an area. We find some, we'll stay there all day. If there's like just a little bit here, they'll move us somewhere else. But you all would know how sometimes it looks. Sometimes you'll find it right where that yeah, Sometimes water. it'll be on the top under the water there, but the wave action puts the sand around on top of it. You gotta dig forward here and there sometimes. Okay. Yep. Oh. So you all use these special shovels. So you guys work seven days a week? No, we work for a local fire department. And we just come out here. You're from the fire department? Some of our days off. That's right. So when will you all stop the cleanup? I guess when all the oil is gone. See, it's kind of brown. Got a little glisten like to it in the sun. Sand is stuck to it. Oh. So you've become an expert at finding it. Oh, I see. And then when it falls, yeah, I, I see the difference. I see. So is this what they call tar balls? Or they call this something else? No, that's pretty much what they general name for it is tar balls, even though it don't look like a ball. Aboard a tour guide and fishing vessel of 30-year veteran Captain Zap, Matura Shepard inquired curiously as she observed the maze of barges dredging to create artificial sand dunes and islands, and laying booms fighting first to keep the oil from the marshes, and then later fighting to keep the oil from returning to the sea from the marshes. 
Realizing that he may never fish the area or conduct a tour in the fast disappearing and dying marshes, he resorted to guiding Matura Shepherd in her quest to learn and return home to educate our people. You have all your birds feeding the marsh, your crabs, your shrimp go along the edges. Uh, if your marsh grass dies, uh, for one, then it just washes away, then the island's gone. If the birds get in there, like marsh hens, and they get it on their feet and, and they're eating, it's gonna kill them. In the midst of all that devastation, boats of natural resources experts set about monitoring the birds, great egrets, pelicans, and many other species of migratory birds, taking blood samples, placing transmitters on the birds to track movement tracking the movements of birds but powerless to reverse the occurrence of the spill and to undo the network of oil drilling infrastructure that now litter the Gulf Coast. Christmas tree wellheads, drill platforms, storage tanks, methane releasing spouts and the never ending maze of underwater oil pipes. Now added to those since the spill were skimmers, barges, booms and a frenzied pace to stop the spouting of the black mess. Yeah, that's a skimmer, and in, in the middle they have some plastic tanks. They're probably all full of oil, because that thing actually runs, and they have booms out, and those little boats kind of pull the booms, and this thing follows, and the oil comes in, and that skims up the oil, so it looks like all oh, pretty dark oil from here, and that's probably tanks on top of that. And then you see all these big plastic bags hanging from the rails. When they pull up the booms, they, they put the, uh, the old booms in those plastic bags and take them to the disposal area. Where is it being disposed? Where, where are the oily booms being disposed? Well, they used to have some, on this uh, Wilkinson Canal, there used to be these big uh, barges full of containers, and they'd fill those containers up with the booms. Now, where are they take it from there? I have no idea. Actually, what they do is they run pipes out into the Gulf, probably, you know, could be two, three miles, and they actually suck sand from the bottom of the Gulf, and they pump it in here. And, uh, that's basically what they're doing now. Will that sand last? No, I think it was just a quick measure, just in, just in case the oil came in more than they could handle it. But, uh, and this dredge has been going on for uh, at least two months, two, three, you know, since probably uh, the end of June. And they basically built an island, I mean, a, a boom, a berm all the way around this whole grassy area over here because they're worried about the oil coming up on the backside too. What happens when it dies, the wave action will break break the stems off. Now, we don't know if it's going to grow back, but the problem is if it doesn't grow back fast enough, the island's going to wash way too fast. Everything out here is, an island like this holds fiddle crabs, holds snails, uh, little shrimp come in here. Of course, you, you predator fish, like especially redfish, they'll come along this bank, and this, this will hold X amount of redfish, uh, uh, and, and your shrimp and your trout. So. When this is gone, they're gone. What does this all mean for Belize? Ocean and its partners have been successful in highlighting what our new reality is as it relates to oil exploration in Belize. Based on the con uh, concentration of effort, it appears most likely that these four regions uh, are most likely to uh, contain oil, perhaps in commercial amounts. But what if there was a blowout the size of the deep water horizon? Uh, as a result of these activities. This is what that slick would look like off the coast of Belize after three days. Responding to it would be equally hopeless or even more hopeless than it was off the coast of Louisiana because even if you had all the oil equipment in the world, uh, it wouldn't make very much difference. There's an even larger threat that comes with oil development that I want to draw your attention to as well. It's been called the curse of natural resource development. If you look at countries around the world, those that are, that are dependent mainly on natural resource extraction tend to be deeply impoverished and hopelessly corrupt when they should be rich and prosperous. Why is that? In our environment of political greed and mistrust, it is not a stretch to imagine that answer. The huge amounts of money <clears throat> involved tend to corrupt all but the most virtuous politicians because it's more efficient for oil companies to buy off a few officials at the top so they can circumvent government regulation and oversight. Development of a high-paying oil industry makes it very difficult for the economy to diversify 
so other sectors are starved of investment, labor, and infrastructure, so the economy becomes heavily dependent on oil. Believe it or not, what those companies are paying to lease your land over your land, your seas, is 20 cents US per acre. It's in the law. It's in our Petroleum Act. And the most that we'll ever pay after eight years is 40 cents US per acre. Even after they find oil, if they find oil, they do not pay more per acre on that surface area. That's how obscene it is. And finally, the public sector then gets inflated far beyond what can be supported without the oil industry, deepening the economic dependence and making it easy for corrupt politicians to reward their supporters with cush public service jobs so they can't be voted out. The net result of this all too often is the country turns into a corrupt petro state where a few people get rich and everybody else gets a lot poorer because the natural resources that they depended on are getting trashed. What are we risking? Right now, you know what we have? We have between three to 4,000 fishers. That's their livelihood. We have tourism workers between 20 to 24,000. 24, Why? Because there's some that are seasonal. This is what it is. BE right now employs 160 Belizeans. That's what we are told. An offshore operation would need to employ more, so we multiplied it at least by two. We say we double it. That would give us only, for the six companies, because although there are eight offshore, we are told only six hope to go into exploration fully. We multiply each company having 320 employees. It is still only 1,290 offshore workers, seasonal too, that will be benefiting and displacing the over 20,000 workers I just told you about. So don't act or don't let them make you believe that we are not getting jobs from these resources. We are, and we cannot take it for granted. And you all must agree, our marine resources are priceless. Your land that you own, an oil company can immediately come, knocking at your door, give you a paper and say, you know what? Our testing shows that the best place for us to get oil is right here. We know you just have this nice house. We know that um, it's the government that helps you to pay for it. They gave it to you, some minister something. But we want that land. And you know what? Honestly, under this law, you cannot stop them. If you try, they will issue an order from the Petroleum and Geology Department. They can get the, a court order forcing you to give them access to that land and drill in your backyard. I am not exaggerating. Better yet, you all remember when Barry Bowen and the Land Owners Association were fighting in court a constitutional matter because Section 17 of our Constitution was to be amended so that you do not have the right to go to court and fight for your compensation should your property be taken away from you arbitrarily? God rest the dead. Mr. Bowen did us a favor. Because the only option you have after they take your land is to go to court and fight for the level of compensation you can get. You cannot get back your land, but you can say, I do not agree with the $10,000 they want to give me for my land. This is worth a million dollars for me. And that is the only right you have to access the court. That same section 13 says this. Notwithstanding the proceedings of section, the minister may, with the approval of cabinet, select contracts, here select contracts, other than through competitive bidding procedures in the following cases. Now talk about giving a man absolute power. Where the technical or economic circumstances make it advisable or better yet, where he, on a woman fancy, determines that the circumstances so require. Offshore oil and gas development is always a gamble. It's a gamble we don't, where we don't really understand the odds. But we know they're getting worse, because as the world runs out of places to drill, the oil companies are forced to look in ever more risky places, like the deep ocean, or in the Arctic, or in the Canadian tar sands, or offshore here in Belize, in, in one of the crown jewels of uh, nature. Second, we still don't know all the ways that oil affects marine ecosystems, 
every oil spill that's been intensively studied has resulted in major discoveries, but unfortunately most oil spills aren't studied much at all. And finally, by far the worst economic effects of an oil spill result from the damage done to confidence. Because we can't really say where the oil will go, how long it will last, or what it will damage, people will always assume the worst and make poor business decisions because of it. Like the havoc caused in, by loss of confidence in financial markets, these effect wreck businesses, economies, and people's lives. In the case of Belize, we have gone from a people proud of our wide open spaces, littered with protected areas, to a colorfully depicted map littered with areas that represent huge blocks of land and sea that now lay vulnerable to the alphabet soup of company names who now hold oil exploration agreements, contracts, and rights. I saw the map. It's, it's, it's dreadful. It's awful. And it, you, there, was, there was no oversight. There's no, there's no government oversight in Belize. You, 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 they, your, 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 your government officials just say, OK, go ahead and do it. It's, fragile. What's your message to the Belizean people on this issue? What can fight, you enlighten them about? Fight, 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 get rid of it. Don't let it take over your life. It's just not good for you. Many have joined the voices to give Belize a wake-up call that offshore drilling is not the way to go. Attacks on these voices of reason claim they are foreign funded with a foreign agenda. Ironically, the same can be said about the oil companies, who are all foreign-owned and take all their profits to their foreign accounts. Man and his quest for energy. The ever-eluding balance between oil exploration and resource and livelihood protection. An Oceana reality. An Oceana advocacy. Join us today. Protect our natural heritage. Become a wave maker today. Thank you.